My last few videos were on the technology of economic planning, the types of maths you use to carry out comprehensive economic planning. Now one of the problems that, or one of the things that Alan Cottrell and I have been accused of is being overly utopian, talking about the far distant future, not talking about the present day, not talking about how you get from the present day to a socialist planned economy. So in this set of uh, videos that I'm starting out on now, I'm going to be talking about what should socialists be proposing as concrete immediate transitional measures in the United Kingdom. Suppose you were a socialist active in the Labour Party, what should you be proposing at the moment? Now I'm not a member of the Labour Party myself, but I'm uh, saying suppose you were, what should you be advocating? I'm going to cover a number of topics in these videos. In today's video, I'm going to look at the economic background that any government would be facing, what its objectives should be, and what it should be doing in the way of exchange rate policy. Now, these may seem odd things to focus on, but they have actually been central issues of British economic policy for almost for for the better part of a century really since the first world war later i'm going to look at tax policy changes to property relations changes to production relations improvements in democracy and defense policies but th those will come later this is just a first talk now you can't understand the political and economic history of the United Kingdom in the 20th century unless you understand the long-term historical conflict which has existed between the manufacturing and finance capital interests. This conflict came to a head back in the 1920s after the First World War with Churchill's decision to go back on the gold standard. Going back on the gold standard meant effectively raising the value of the pound. This meant that manufacturing industry could only go on exporting if they were able to force wages down. And since the coal industry was at that time a major export industry in the country, this meant that the mine owners immediately embarked on a policy of wage cuts. This led the mine workers out on strike and eventually led to the general strike in support of the mine workers. And the continuation of this policy through the 1930s certainly led to more depression and more unemployment than would otherwise have been the case. Now, why was this in the interests of finance capital? Well, finance capital has loan books, loans which have to be paid in sterling. And it is, was in their interest that the value of sterling be high so that the value of the loan repayments and the interest they got was high and fixed in gold. After 1945, the influence of finance capital on British politics and economic policy was markedly reduced. It was reduced because the financing of the war had forced the state to take over and sell off large quantities of foreign capital holdings held by the City of London. This loss of overseas investment meant that post-war British governments were faced with having to meet the trade deficit primarily by increasing exports. Britain had historically run a large trade deficit financed by capital earnings from overseas capital owned by the City of London. And in addition, prior to Indian independence, by direct taxes 
levied on India. The loss of overseas capital investment, the, the independence of India meant that industrial production and the promoting of industrial exports became a key concern of government. And the governments of Attlee and Wilson were willing to devalue the pound, therefore hitting the entrance of finance capital in order to cheapen exports. Now this represented a historically significant shift in the balance of power between two branches of the capitalist class. And not just the Labour Party was involved in that. Harold Macmillan, the 1950s Conservative Prime Minister, was a Prime Minister from a seat in the north of England that had been heavily affected by the recession of the 1930s and his family business was an industrial capitalist business and the Tory government headed by him continued the same policy of giving priority to industrial capital over finance capital. This policy had long-term effects. Giving priority to industry tended to favour the industrial working class. It meant there was a tight labour market. A tight labour market led to strong unions. State intervention to favour industry meant that economic decisions came to be seen as political decisions, ones about which the trade unions had a legitimate interest and this interest was, interest was listened to. Unions then therefore became major factors determining national economic policy to the extent that trade union leaders were regularly having to be invited in by the prime ministers of the day to beer and sandwiches whilst they discussed what should be done about some particular economic crisis. And over time there was a shift in the share of national income in favour of the working class. The longer the period of industrial priority, the longer the period of full employment went on, the stronger the bargaining position of the working class became. Now this process in the end led to the crisis of post-war laborism. You got an increasing economic dual power between labor and capital. The fact that you had a declining profit share in national income along with a prolonged period of capital investment which raised the capital to labor ratio meant that the rate of profit fell. Faced with a tendency of the rate of profit to decline, which was becoming evident by the late 1960s, the private sector became increasingly unwilling to invest. The ability of trade unions to win wage increases and the willingness of the Bank of England to provide further credit to keep the economy going under these circumstances led to wage price inflation. By the mid-1970s, you had a crisis of the mixed economy. And either the economy had to shift back to a classical free market economy or it had to move further towards a state-controlled economy, one in which investment decisions were no longer taken on the basis of private profit, but were taken on the basis of some kind of national plan and in which the endemic struggle between labour and capital at the point of production was resolved by the establishment of a system of workers' control. Now, these issues were actually being debated in national politics in the mid-1970s. 
uh, they, they were crystallised in the policy of the alternative economic strategy, which the Benite left of the Labour Party was pushing. Now, as things turned out, the Benites were defeated and Callaghan set off on a course which was later accentuated by the Thatcher government. What Thatcherism represented was the reassertion of control by the City of London, the reassertion of control by finance capital. Now, this was possible because of a particular conjuncture. The discovery of North Sea Oil removed the balance of payment constraint that post-war governments had been under. From oil exports, the country started to actually have a, a balance of payment surplus. This meant that Thatcher could afford to throw industry and the industrial working class on the scrap heap, to deliberately run down industry in order to destroy the social power of the industrial working class. The temporary balance of payment surplus enabled the city to resume its position of exporting capital, exporting capital to the United States and the rest of the world. And this increasing economic influence of the city meant that it had more and more political power. And economic policy became entirely subservient to the interests of finance capital. Profitability was restored, the workers' share of national income declined, but at the same time actual industrial investment and industrial productivity stagnated. The oil surplus was something temporary, only lasted 10, 12 years or so. The strong pound policy which had actually led to the latter period of the Thatcher government adopting a fixed exchange rate again, failed on Black Wednesday in the run on the pound. The, in order to try and maintain the exchange rate, interest rates had to be raised to punishing levels. When that failed, the response was to allow the pound to float. The aim being that the city would channel private loan finance in to cover the deficit. In consequence, no attention was paid to industry, which continued to shrink. And the effect of the trade deficit was masked by private sector borrowing under Blair and Brown. So we see from 2000 continuous trade deficits getting even worse in the more recent years. This is the, the balance level. So all years apart from a brief period in 2011 there was a trade deficit. How did all this work? Well this is the mechanism of the Blair Bar Brown boom. The city accepted capital from abroad in the form of deposits with the city banks. Some of this was then loaned to the British government to cover the government uh, deficit. Another large part was loaned to the private sector, either to firms or to households in the form of mortgage loans and credit card loans. At the same time, some of the foreign capital coming in was directed to the sale of UK utilities, water companies, railway companies, etc. And the revenue from these sales of utilities essentially went to, into the private sector and the private sector then paid for imports, paid for the net imports, with dollars and euros which had been channelled in originally from the from the City of London in the form of these loans. So the City of London shifted from acting as a capital export mechanism to becoming a capital import mechanism. 
but since they made a significant part of their profits on financial intermediation, they didn't really care where the capital had come from. They could expand under these circumstances just as well as they could expand with the export of capital. And in fact, the total mass of loans to the private sector and to individuals grew. And as that happened, so the mass of interest payments that people were making also grew. But there was a limit to how long this could go on. On the one hand, there's only so much productive capital stock that could be sold off to foreign investors. On the other hand, investment in property in the form of houses, buildings, land, was only attractive to foreign speculators so long as property prices continued to rise. Some of this investment in landed property was direct. You had acquisition of new blocks of flats that were then held um, empty in London. Other was indirect via the banks putting out mortgage loans to private individuals in Britain. British financial institutions, most famously the Northern Rock, borrowed heavily from overseas banks to lend on the UK mortgage market. The process came to an abrupt halt when the degree of indebtedness had become prohibitive and the Northern Rock failed. And that led to the bursting of the housing bubble in 2009. The basic mechanism of credit recycling and trying to offset a decline in manufacture by borrowing had shown its limits. The Tory governments which have come since then have done nothing to address the basic problem of the trade deficit. They talk about cutting the deficit, but by cutting the deficit they mean cutting the public sector deficit. In practice it's extremely difficult for a country that's running a trade deficit to avoid having a public de sector deficit as well. The simplest way to understand this is to realise that a trade deficit means that money is flowing out of the country, which is then beyond the reach of the UK taxman. It's not the revenue that accrues from the sales of those uh, imports accrues to foreigners who are not taxed in Britain and therefore the tax, tax um, revenues tend to decline. There is a basic budgetary law that all governments are bound by, which is that the surplus of the overseas sector has to equal the deficit of the public sector and the deficit of the private sector. Since the Tory austerity didn't cut this, it didn't cut the surplus of the overseas sector, which is the trade deficit of Britain, the only way that the Tories have been able to cut the public sector deficit has been forcing firms and households to borrow. An obvious example of that is the extension of student loans so that an activity which was formerly financed out of tax revenues, now people have to take out loans from the banks to cover that themselves. So if the, the state can force the private sector to borrow more, then it can cut its public sector deficit, even though the trade deficit has not been removed. And as I showed you earlier, the trade deficit certainly hasn't been removed. It's got worse. So what's the best option that a Labour government could do? There's either to be a reduction in domestic com uh, consumption or a rise in industrial production as import substitution and as exports. Now, it's obviously preferable to achieve it by increasing production rather than reducing people's consumption. But given the long-term rundown of UK industry, this is going to require a lot of capital investment. My estimate, which is just rough, rough run of the mill estimate is that 
closing the trade deficit would require around an extra 200 billion of fixed capital investment in industry. If a government was aiming to carry out that level of investment over four years, it would have to raise investment as a share of national income to about 20% from the, the, the 17% or so that it's been under the Tories. Now that's not something that's impossible. This is the, the share of investment of national income in the recent past, but we can see in the late 60s and 70s it was between 20 and 25 percent. And it was the objective of the, the Wilson government to raise it to 25 percent, for example. So previous governments have been able to have a high level of industrial investment, but that high level of industrial investment was part of this industry first policy, the for policy which tended to favour the industrial working class and tended to strengthen the trade unions. Just for comparison, the Chinese invest around 45% of their national income. How can all this be done? What kind of measures? Well, it's easier for a mixed economy like contemporary China or Britain in the 1970s to, to achieve a high level of investment. In both cases, large sections of the economy were made up of nationalised industries and still are in China. And firms like that can be set investment targets as part of national policy, um, rather than only investing when they anticipate a good profit. But if you had a, a government coming in now, they'll face a very different situation. The nationalised industries have all been sold off, and the industrial sector as a whole is much smaller. There's also the danger of capital flight. Now, what do we mean by capital flight? Does it mean stripping down and shipping off car factories to China? Or does it refer to something purely financial? There's some ambiguity when people talk about this. If we talk about it in the first sense, capital flight damages the industrial capacity of the economy real plant and equipment is shipped out of the country. In the second case though, all that can ever happen is a change in the ownership of existing assets. Let's look at what happens with financial flight. Insofar as it has any effect, it is to cause a depreciation of the pound relative to the euro or the dollar. And if you've got floating exchange rates, that's not necessarily a serious problem. It was a problem for Labour governments of the 60s when they tried to maintain a fixed exchange rate or for Norman Lamont and Black Wednesday in 1992. But that was a problem because they were trying to keep the exchange rate fixed against the dollar or the euro. The pound fell due to capital flight in the hours after Brexit, but that didn't cause any major crisis in 2016. And given that the pound is heavily overvalued, and the trade deficit proves it, uh, an incoming socialist government shouldn't be panicked by such a run on the pound. Instead, it'd be better to welcome it using phrases like it's a long overdue and necessary correction, and this is great for news for expert uh, supporters, etc. When you think of it, what happens when capital in this sense is moved out of the country? An individual owner of shares in British firms can sell those shares and buy shares instead denominated in euros in a German or a French firm. But in order to sell their shares, someone must have bought it off them. So all that has happened is a change in who owns those shares. And the net effect can only be an effect on the, the foreign exchange rate, which, as I've said, is not something to be too scared about. On the other hand, physical capital flight is a serious matter. 
You don't want firms closing down their operations and moving plant and equipment abroad. And it's quite possible that if a government came in to power in Britain and was going to enhance workers' rights, that firms would threaten to do just this. They would threaten to close their plant and equipment here and move it abroad. But although people say capital can be moved very fast, what they mean by capital being moved very fast is financial transactions. And that can be done by computer. And that can be done really fast. But you can't instantaneously ship a car factory out of the country. It has to be carefully disassembled, moved out through a port. And physical export of capital is easy for a government to control. The government can impose export licenses on the physical movement of capital goods. And it would be wise for any uh, socialist government to introduce systems of export licenses for capital goods very promptly. So, responses to the immediate crisis, don't attempt to prevent a run on sterling. Allow it to depreciate because the long term effects of that are favourable. At the same time, introduce export licenses on physical capital goods to regulate physical asset stripping. In my next talk, I will get on to talking about tax policy and changes in property relations, which would be necessary in order to carry out an enhanced level of investment.